Okay, um, before we continue what we were talking about, I'm going to try from time to time to give you a pearls of what I call wisdom. You can decide whether they're wise or not. And also, you know, some certain things about teaching. Um, and I want to start with something that's pretty close to my heart. Some of you, I don't know if you can tell on the tape, but uh, I, from time to time I, I wear hearing aids when I give this, um, this, uh, uh, the class. Um, and I do have a hearing problem. And uh, I want to tell you the key here is from time to time. Um, if you have students who wear hearing aids, Hearing aids are not glasses. I put on my glasses, I see 2020, I have my Verilux lens, I have my Bible, I can see great, okay? Hearing aids don't work that way. They're a pain in the neck to most people who wear them. Okay, most people have uneven hearing losses, and so, and it's very difficult, and so for years, I knew about my hearing loss for years, it's at higher levels, uh, particularly the higher the pitch, the better, so it's very, it's harder for me to hear voice, particularly women's voices because they're higher than men's voices. And I, I told my wife when I came home with the first analysis, I said, you see, I told you I wasn't ignoring you. The doctor says I can't hear you, right? So, but it's, it's difficult. And, and for years, the doctor told me there's nothing I can do for you because I could hear low voices well, like background noises, like trucks going by. That I can hear fine. Put in hearing aids, it was like, you know, he, he, it's, you know it just amplifies those horrible sounds. So now they have digital hearing aids, but they don't work too well, right? They're very difficult. For instance, if I have students giving a presentation, a PowerPoint machine is on, it's going Rrr. If I put my hearing aids on, even though there's a, supposed to be an adjustment to adjust for it, it's like a truck running through my head, right? It's just, it's just unbearable. Those of you in your class will notice when you come to talk to me afterwards, I take out the hearing aids because I can't hear because of all the background noise of people, you know, just talking. So, and a lot, of, and there are different kinds of hearing losses, and you'll hear, see kids, the people, the audiologists will tell you, wear them all the time. Most of them don't have a hearing loss. You know, they really can't personally understand the, you know, what, what a pain in the neck they can be. So if you see kids popping hearing aids in and out and in different circumstances, and then when they pop them out, they can't hear you as well, you'll know that's, you know, there, there are reasons for it. The other thing you have to understand, um, uh, if you're outside, especially with younger kids, my wife um, was, is a teacher, and she had one kid, and it started to rain, a couple of drops, and all of a sudden, one kid just took off, and he tore out, you know, off the group, and he ran into the building without, you know, thinking. And uh, so I said to her, does he wear hearing aids? She said, yeah, how'd you know? Okay, the first rule that you have of hearing aids is don't get them wet. And by the way, they cost a lot of money, thousands of dollars. So if you see, and of course he could have taken them off, but he was in you know, sixth grade. He didn't think about it. He could have taken them off, put them in his pocket. So have to be careful. Kids often will have certain habits or ideas they get into. I guess with any condition like that, that's the one I know about the best because I said I, I, I have hearing problems. Um, so you have to be careful about that and be tolerant of what may consider what you can consider behavior. I mean, you can say, that you just, can you just take it out of your pocket, take it out of your, stick it in your pocket? But he just, you know, it was pumped into his head. If it starts to run, get out of there. Or if kids are splashing each other, you'll often find kids like that who will be, you know, they'll, they'll back off because they're warned. You know, these things cost thousands of dollars, don't get them wet. And they'll, so anyway, just you, have to, you need to be tolerant of that. And in general, of things that are supposed to be nice fixes, you know, people in wheelchair, oh, now they can move, they can get around. Well, maybe. So you have to be very careful about that. And by the way, I guess the, the, the same applies to certain kinds of, of, uh, of vision. From time to time, I have students in here who say, I have a hearing problem. And I say, well, you want to sit up front? And they say, no, not really. Now, that one I don't, okay, because they, they um, whatever it is, doesn't help, okay? doesn't help so and, and I that I don't know and and um, also have to be careful of kids having problems not to turn their backs people with hearing problems read lips I never learned how to read lips but I do <laughs> right just a little bit the doctor told me just a self-defense mechanism you developed right so I have to have people looking at me be sure you try to look at people not you know turn your back to the board and say 50 to two different things so you have to be careful about that and if you see a person doing things, engaging in behaviors that you don't quite understand, you should ask before you get upset. Okay, that's true with seeing too. I so most of us can have pretty good corrections with glasses, but not everybody. And if people engage in behaviors that seem strange to you, ask before you get upset because you don't know. And especially with young kids who may, you know, who may not have figured out a way to uh, 
you know, to sort of blend in and to compensate. You know, they can't compensate as when we get to Piaget. They don't have the kind of strategies to compensate as well as older people. Okay, that's my nugget of wisdom for today, and I hope you're you're realizing you're tolerant of it. And and by the way, if you the other side of it is that uh, I had this hearing loss for a long, long time, right? As a matter of fact, the, the doctor I went to said it's probably genetic, you know, especially after examining me several times. It's not getting any worse. And um, I finally spotted it myself when I was much older, okay? And, I, you know, and, and if, if you find somebody going, ha, huh, I didn't hear that, or seems to skip stuff, or says, well, I didn't hear you say that, you might want to drop a gentle hint on the counsel. Let the kid get her get her hearing checked. Today's a her day, right? My son, I spotted his the fact that he was I mean, he was so nearsighted, he was legally blind without his glasses, and I had that wonderful operation, but right? And I spotted it one day I was taking him to a bowling alley and I said, We're we're, we're in alley thirty five. And he said, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> And he said, Dad, I can't see the numbers. And, uh, you know, a, 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 probably a teacher ought to spot it. I should probably spot it earlier. So I took him to class. God's good boy. This kid is hopefully nearsighted for an eight year old. He said, or a 10 year old. Already. He was dead. So you, you need to be aware of things like that. If a kid keeps saying hi or says, says I didn't hear, don't get angry. Say, oh, you weren't listening. You might want to keep your eye on a child like that or one who says I copied it off the board and copied it wrong you might want to keep your eye on him to see if there are hearing and, and, and vision problems and some kids will respond but the and the younger the child the less likely the child is to know that he or she has a problem all right okay that's that pearl of wisdom and you should you ought to be tolerant before you get upset is what I'm saying or look for a problem before you assume the kids being a wise guy okay what we were talking about is something that kind of seems unrelated to psychology, which is, although it is to teaching, about statistics and tests. And the last thing that we talked about was the idea of, fine, of comparing people to one another, right, norms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and comparing and using, using a mean. That's, I mean, I, if, no, I mean... If I'm going on a vacation and someone tells me, well, the average high temperature in Nome, Alaska is four, I mean, it's a little high, right? And the average high temperature in, uh, you know, in, in San Diego is 76, <coughs> right? Then I said, gee, I probably want to go to San Diego. But if someone tells me, well, there's a very wide deviation in Nome, right? It gets 50 below, but it can get to be 50, 60 above in the summer. There's a big deviation, standard deviation of temperatures. Somebody said there's a huge standard deviation. I might say, well, let me look into the summers. By the way, I grew up in the north. Don't like the cold. Hate the snow. Grew up in the snow belt. Okay, snow, y'all. Who's from Houston? You know what snow is? That white stuff that falls out of the sky. You can, you can watch it on television. Okay, so in any case, the, um, so it, this gives us good information. Okay, and as I said, if I know I have a class with a large standard deviation in scores, I have a different problem from one with a small standard deviation in scores. But something else happened with standard deviations, okay? And that is, let's go to the PowerPoint for one second. And this is where we left off. See how close you can get it? I'm going to turn and see how it looks on a regular screen. This is what's called a normal distribution. And we talk, come back to me for a second. Okay, and we found out, scientists found out that many, many things distribute normally. I had my softball player, and I hate softball person up here, right? And we said that even though, right, I would have them all, I would have the two of them throw, um, throw uh, a softball, thank you. If, you know, one would throw like this, the, the, I have no interest in softball person, this is supposed to be a normal distribution. The other one would like this for the throws. So the mean is much lower for the person who's not the player from the one who is the, uh, the softball player, the outfielder, right? But the throws would distribute normally, and that's generally true, okay? Come back to me. Of many, many phenomena. So, and, and for reasons you don't know, you, sometimes you go and you listen to the radio. Like this morning, I was listening to the radio. There are accidents everywhere, right? 
And sometimes you come in and there are, the reporter is just sitting there and doesn't know what to do. Well, I, nothing to report, no accident, right? But usually there's one here and one there. So if you were to look at the number of accidents um, in here, come back, let's go back to this. If you were to look at the number of accidents in Houston, Texas, let's say over a 10-year period, you'd get this, okay? <coughs> this is the year. This is the, uh, uh, this is the number of times you had the accidents. And this is the number of accidents, let's say over a 30-year period, right? So this is the average number of accidents, right? And as you go to less and more, nobody knows why. It's just sort of, it's just come, it's just a lot of things distribute that way. Come back to me for a second. Okay, so I knew, a, once I had a doctoral student who was, had been a chief of police in a small town in, in um, central Texas near well, it actually, was here in some Wharton, not Central Texas, so south of here, and he and he was getting a doctorate in in uh, he had had a master's in criminology. He was getting a doctorate to teach criminology, right, in higher education. He was one of my students, and he they had a meeting of all the police chiefs. And one year, for some reason, the crime rate was down. It was down, right? They were going to splash it in the paper, etc. He said, "Did you do anything different?" Well, not really. Did you enforce anything? Well, not really. He said, I wouldn't do it if I were you. <laughs> he said, because next year it's going to go back up. This is just one of those freak years that's off the mean, right? He said, if you get one year where it's high, then you could publish an article and say, much higher than the average, we're going to work harder. And then next year it'll probably go back toward the mean, right? It's called regression toward the mean. There's a certain right sense of the things. Well, we'll talk about that. Um, a little later, okay? Not everything distributes normally. For instance, smoking doesn't distribute normally. Most people either smoke a ton or not at all. So if the average number of, of cigarettes that if you ask everybody, every person over 15, 15 and older in the United States, how many cigarettes do you smoke a day? And the average was 12. You're not gonna find too many people smoking 12 cigarettes a day. You're going to find a whole lot of people smoking, not smoking at all. And most people who smoke, smoke two packs a day, three packs a day, right? People tell you they smoke a pack a day. Usually that means they buy a pack a day and bum another pack a day of other people or something, right? Smoking is highly... So that doesn't distribute normally, okay? Uh, there are... Uh, so you... I, I, my guess is that... Alcohol consumption probably doesn't distribute normally either. There are probably clumps at the end of people who drink a lot and people who hardly drink at all. Is so anybody here who, for all practical purposes, doesn't drink? You never, yeah. You know, if I ask you in a given week, you wouldn't drink at all. Yeah, you see we've got well over half the class here. So there would probably be clumps. And of course we have people with alcohol problems. In. And, and my guess is, again, there probably aren't too many people who consistently drink three drinks a day, right? There are a lot of people who have no drinks or one drink a day, right? Every once in a blue moon, they'll have a few drinks or go on a binge, but, they know, but, but that may be the average. But a lot of things distribute normally. A lot of things distribute normally. And something happened. Something happened. I think I finally learned how to use this. Here, let's go here. Something happened when they got normal distributions. Okay. Now I'm going to here. I'm going to show you something. Who remembers being tortured like this? The circumference of a circle equals two pi r or pi d. Remember that? The area the area equals pi r squared. Okay, come back to me. We're going to take a vote. I want to see how many people are convinced that pi, I'm going to vote myself, was some weird construct that math teachers made up to torture people because they get joy, they're sadistic, they're sadistic and get joy out of torturing us. Who's convinced of that? I'm, I was, I'm absolutely convinced of that. Too many. Okay, but I'll show you what pi is, okay? If we say, let's go back to the tablet. If we say, the overhead, that their circumference equals pi d, let's divide each side by d, okay? 
this cancels out. And what we get is that if you take any circle and divide its circumference by its diameter, you get this weird value that's called pi. Okay? All right, so come back to me. So if I take an astronaut and say, go out in your rocket ship and draw a circle that has a circumference of a million miles, right? Okay, and then I take one of these people, you know, in the, they sit in the, in the booths in the shopping centers, right? We'll write, the, we'll write the name of you and your whole family on a grain of rice, right? That's right. So we have 14 brothers, no problem. 22 sisters, no problem, okay? I say, draw me the smallest circle that you can, right? And I take those two circles, one with a circumference of a tenth of a millimeter, and one with a circumference of a, I mean, with a, a diameter of a tenth of a millimeter, one with a diameter of a million miles, and I divide the circumference, I measure the circumference divided by the diameter, I'll get pi. The point I'm trying to make here is that it's, it's a, what's called, it's what's called a, let's go over here, it's what's called a universal constant. They may call it something else now, but that's what I call it. Constant. Oh, there are lines here. I didn't realize that. A universal constant, okay? In other words, it's just, that's just the way it is. Okay? That's just the way it is. Okay, come back to me now. Now, I'm going to yell this so you know it's important. Provided, provided that you have a normal distribution. You've got to have a normal distribution for this to be true. There is a very interesting and consistent relationship between means and standard deviations. Okay? Now let me show, let's go back to the PowerPoint and I'll show it to you. Okay? And some statisticians just spent her or his time counting. If you have a normal distribution as we have here, then roughly 34% of the scores will fall between minus one standard deviation, the score that's minus one standard deviation, and the score that's, that's the mean, and 34 between the score that's the mean and plus one standard deviation. That probably, 30% of you probably understood that. So let me show it to you. Let's go to the tablet again. Let's say I have a mean. The average score on the test was 72. Okay? I'll make it an even number. Okay? Although it never is. Okay? And the standard deviation, when I figured it out, was 6. Okay? I just went through all that math that I showed you last time. And the standard deviation was 6. Okay? So what I'm saying. So what's the score that's one standard deviation below the mean? The mean is six points. What? Push it down and say it. Isn't that 66? 66, right? You understand? You got it? No. Look. Look. The average number of points that people got on this test was 72. Right? That's the average number of the points they got. Let's say there are 125 items on the test. I don't know, whatever. Or 100, doesn't matter. When I figured up the standard deviation, what's the average amount that scores deviate from that mean? Remember? I subtracted each score from the mean and then I took the average of how much they deviated. Except I had to square it first, right? To get rid of the minus signs, right? The average of the amount that they deviated was six points. That was the average deviation, or what they call the standard deviation, right? They didn't want to mess up average to the score and average to the... That's the average amount that they deviated, right? Do you understand what I'm saying here? I added up, so this one was 12 points off, this one was 5 points off, this one was 50 points off, 15 points off, this one was 2 points off, right? This, one, this person got a 70, this person got a, an 80, so the... The 70 was 2 points off, the 80 was 8 points off, right? When I took the average of that, okay, after I squared them, 
I squared them, I took the average, and I took the square root again, the average came out six. So the score that's the one standard deviation below the mean, that add, that's one standard deviation below the mean, is one that's six points below. It's six points, it's the one average deviation below the mean, right? 72 minus six is, help me out here. But I have fingers, see? <laughs> By the way, those of you who are elementary school teachers, a kid finally figures out how to add by using her fingers. You say, don't use your fingers. What? You know how to do it if you use your fingers? Don't do it. Stay confused. <laughs> you really think the kid who's adding 6 and 4 and gets 10 with her fingers is still going to be using her fingers when she's 26? Come on. Give me a break here. Okay. So in, in any case, you see this? So 66 is the score that's a standard deviation below the mean. You got it now? You understand it? And the standard deviation, this is minus one standard deviation. And the score that's a, that's a standard deviation above the mean, that's six points above, right? Help me out here, six, seven, eight. Don't have to carry, good, 78, okay? You got it? 72 plus six is 78, right? It's one standard deviation above the mean. It's a, the standard deviation is six points, so it's one standard deviation worth of points above the mean. It's 78. Okay? You got it more or less? All right. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. So what I'm going to find is that for this test, 34% of the scores are going to be between 72 and 78 and 34 are going to be between 72 and what did we figured out was 66, okay? If on the next test, I get a much bigger standard deviation, let's say the next test, let's say I have, okay, I give several items and the average on the test is 87 and the standard deviation is 10. Well, 34% of the scores are going to be between 87 and 97, and 34 are going to be 87 and 77, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter what the standard deviation is. As long as I have a normal distribution, right? So I'll give you an example, okay? If I, okay, come back to me. If I take the standard deviation of temperatures in Seattle, it's going to be much smaller. The, the, the average amount that they deviate is very little, right? It probably, my cousin lives in Seattle, I once asked him, it probably doesn't get much colder than 50 in Seattle, and it rarely goes above 80-something, okay? And those are extreme days. That's my, I mean, I'm not sure that that's true, but that's what he tells me. He's a scientist, yeah, I mean, he's a scientist but he's no meteorologist, but it doesn't get... Okay, and I take the, the deviation of temperatures, how much are, is a given day off from the average of, let's say, 76. Okay, then I go to Amarillo, and let's say I also have an average of 76. Well, I'm going to get deviations. In Amarillo, it gets, down to, it gets down well below freezing, very cold, and it gets hot as can be. I think there was a day in Amarillo that they had temperatures over 105 for a week a few years ago. It's unbelievable. Okay, just I used to follow it in the newspaper until it got too depressing. Okay, so because I, I'll use it as an example. Okay, so I'm going to have a bigger standard deviation. So let's say the average standard deviation is 10 in Amarillo and 3 in Seattle, right? 3 degrees versus 10 degrees. But if, if 76 is the average temperature, then, then in, in Amarillo, if I have 76 and standard deviation of 10, 34%, 34.13% of the days, there will be a temperature between 76 and 86. And in Seattle, if my average is, is 76, okay, my standard deviation is 3, then 34% of the days I have a temperature between 76 and 79, 34.13%. You understand what I'm saying? As, and, and temperatures tend to distribute normally, okay? They tend to distribute normally, okay? But right, let's go back and finish this off, okay? Let's just take a let's say I have a, a, a and let's say I have a, a, a test where I have an average of, of 80 and my standard deviation is 10. 
I'm going to find 34.13% of the cases between 80 and 90. Basically, this is usually rounded off, 14% between 90 and 100, and 2% between 100 and 110. Let's say there were 150 questions on the test, right? Likewise, if, it's hun if my standard deviation happens to be 10 and my average was 100, I'm going to find I'm going to find 34% of the cases between 90 and 100, 13.59 between 80 and 90, and 2.14 between 70 and 80. This, if you add all these up, 90, in a normal distribution, 99% of the cases fall within three standard deviations. Then you have a, have a, half a percent that's more, that's way out, and another half a percent that's way out, okay? That's more than three standard deviations. Okay, come back to me. That's just how it worked. Just like the circumference of a circle. That's just how it works. Period. Okay, just how it is. Nobody knows why. Just like nobody knows why pi is the circumference of a circle. So pi, so pi is the answer to the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter. Nobody knows why, just how it is. Well, this only this stayed an interesting little tidbit of information for not very long, because all of a sudden, somebody said, "Holy mackerel! I have an idea how I can use this for tests." There was not a person sitting in this room, watching this by tape, or watching this via streaming, or watching it on television, who has not been tortured by this particular phenomenon. Because this particular finding is the bedrock on which all standardized tests are based. IQ tests, SATs, GREs, MATs are not. But Iowa tests of basic skills and the Metropolitan Achievement Test and anybody from the Northeast here? Yeah, did you ever take the Metropolitan Achievement Test when you were a kid? Did you take it? Oh, man, that tortured kids forever. Where are you from? Push it down. Push it down. Michigan. Well, that's the Midwest. They use it mostly in the Northeast. Where were you from? Me. Yeah. Push it down. Push it down. Where? New York. New York City? And Brooklyn. Push it down. Push it down. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Oh, they must have stopped. I lived in New York City for, for a few years. I must have proctored five billion. I was a teacher for a year and a half there in public schools. Then I went to a private school. I, I can't, can't imagine. I was a new teacher, so I got some of those lousy duties, so many metropolitan achievement tests. They're all based on them. Maybe they moved to a new one now. All kinds of, all these tests are based upon this. Because here's what people said. They said, you know what? How many people have ever had a test where you had a percentile? Great, what percentile you were in? That's all based on this. They said, you know what? We can use this, this particular mechanism to measure how well you did, how many standard deviations above or below the mean you were compared to everybody else. You understand what I'm saying? And not only that, but let's say it's a history test. I used to be a history teacher when I was using history, okay? Let's say it's an American history test. So I'm going to give the, the same test. Now I don't have to make 52 different tests. I'm going to take the same test and give it, what's the first year you learn American history? They, fifth grade? No? The eighth grade they teach it, right? They still do it in fifth grade in elementary school one year? No, no not anymore. Sometimes. So, where, where do they? In Texas? Go ahead. Texas what? They do Texas history in elementary schools. Yeah. Eighth, let's, say, so I'm gonna get, let's say I have a school. I'm going to give it to eighth graders. Then I'm going to give it to eleventh graders. They also have history, right? Then I'm going to give it to college, to college students who have already taken their introductory history class, American history class. 
then I'm going to give it to college students who are American history made who have American history majors. Then I'll give it to people who have graduated with a degree in American history within the last five years. Then I'll give it to people who have a master's degree in American history. Then I'll give it to people who have a doctorate in American history, all within the last five years. I mean, I have a best in history. I don't remember anything, right? It's a long time ago. And as long as the scores for each group distribute normally, I can use the same test, right? You understand? So I can say, well, I gave it to the fifth graders. I had uh, 200 questions, right? The average number right was 22. And a standard deviation of 3. OK? Let's go to the tablet. Okay, I learned how to use it, you'll notice. Here we go. Let's go to the tablet. So for my fifth graders, the average score, the mean, was 22, and I scanned a standard deviation of three points. So if you got a 25, I'd say, oh, you're a standard deviation above the mean for your age group, OK? Then let's say I give it to eighth graders. They had an average of 45 on the test and a standard deviation of 6. Oh, so if you got a 51, you're plus one standard deviation above the mean, right? No sweat. I give it to the college grads, history, gra history, may, history grads, you know, uh, let's say a BA. Oops, sorry. A BA, their average was uh, 92. At a mean of 92, and the standard deviation was 10. So if you got 92, 102, you were plus one of the mean, right? Okay, come back to me. Okay, no, no, don't come back. Stay here. Now, originally, some people say, "Gee, I wonder why there's such a small standard deviation here, and such a big one here, and a more moderate one here." The answer to these people, the answer from the people who were doing standardized tests now was, shut up. We don't care about that anymore. What we have is a beautiful system to use the same test. Now, it has to distribute normally across all these age groups. And believe me, it takes a lot of work to do that. And then I can use this test to measure how many standard deviations above and below the mean you are. So let's say a fifth grader, here, we'll divide this by the grades, okay? Let's say a fifth grader got a 22. What score would that fifth grader have? Yeah. Got exactly the average. How many standard deviations above or below the mean is the student? Zero. Zero. Your score would be zero. Okay? See what I'm saying? You see why it's zero? You're not above the mean, you're not below the mean. You're right on the mean. You're no points above the mean. You're no points below the mean. You're zero points above or below the mean. Okay. Let's go to this one because I can make the point better. Let's say a college history major got a 92. Okay. What would his score be? Zero. zero. College history grad. Let's say one of them got an 82. Standard deviation is 10, right? What would his score be? Minus, Minus 1. Let's say somebody, though, got a 90, a 90. What would that person's score be? I don't know. Minus 0.2, something like that, right? You can stick in decimals, right? Mm -hmm. Who's taking statistics? Anybody? What's this called? What kind of score is this? A score that measures straight out how many standard deviations above below the mean you are. A Z score? A Z score. This is a Z score. And statisticians still use them. Okay? This principle is the principle behind the SAT, behind the GRT, GRE, behind the IQ test, behind standardized achievement tests, every standardized achievement test that's given in the schools. Did I say that before? I'm going to say it again. Believe me before we're done. This principle of using
deviation scores. How many standard deviations above or below the mean you are? Okay. Wait a minute here. Okay. This principle of using deviation scores. Okay. Let's here. Let's go back to the. I'm making. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Deviation scores. Here are standard deviations. These are called standard. These are called deviation scores. Standardized scores based on standard deviations are sometimes called deviation scores. Okay, come back to me. This principle is behind all the tests. If you put out an achievement test that didn't use this principle, okay, you would sell it to zero school districts. Because you can't have it interact with the IQ test. And this principle of measuring deviation, using scores to measure deviation, is what replaced the old IQ formula, mental age, divided by chronological age, whatever it was. Chronological age divided by mental age. Is that what it was? Who remembers? Okay. Mental age divided by chronological age. Okay. Times 100. Okay. That was, that, repla that replaced it. Okay, and that's how IQ tests work. Everyone is given the same questions at different ages, and you're com okay, and you're compared how well each child who's tested, or adult or adolescent who's tested, is compared to how well she or he did compared to the average of that age by how many standard deviations above or below the mean. Okay, that's how it works. And it's not an easy job, because if I have questions and all of a sudden I come to one age group and the scores don't distribute normally, now it's never perfect. It's got to be more or less standard. But if I get a one age group and all of a sudden a whole bunch of people are getting rotten scores on a certain subtest of the IQ test, or a whole bunch of people at this given age, you know, they all clump at the top or clump in a certain place, I gotta smooth it, I gotta rework the test. That's why from one IQ test to the next, the questions are quite similar. Right? Now there is one difference. The way the IQ, when you take the SAT, when you took the SAT, how many people took the SAT? Anybody take the ACT? I don't know as much about that one, but I believe they words are the same way. Your score goes in and is part of the average, you know, your score goes in and is part of averaging what people did on this. The IQ, it doesn't work that way. The IQ, they take a certain number of kids of a given age, okay, they give them the answers, they give them the questions, they see what the average number right and what the standard deviation is for that age. Okay, and everybody is compared to that group of kids until the next test comes out. You understand what I'm saying? So when you're, when you're giving IQ tests to kids, th th their answers don't influence IQ tests, right? Don't influence anything. You're all being compared to the original group of students. When you took the SAT, your score, and I believe the ACT works the same way, I'm not sure, influences what goes on. That makes it a little tougher then because if in one year a whole bunch of people take it and do rotten, or if in one year a whole bunch of people take it and do very, very well, and that's going to happen, right? Just again, by the dumb luck of the odds, right? I don't know. So they have an adjustment. They have sort of like a rolling average and not letting, you know, a specific, or, or there'll be some years where very, not too many people are taking it, right? And that sort of, and even so, if, even if they did well, they won't have as much influence as the year before because so many more people took it. So they have a way to adjust. I think they call it a delta adjustment. But it's basically the same principle. Now, this sounds lovely. But it has a problem. The problem is, from my perspective, is that the tail wags the dog. Okay, if you go to people who make any of these standardized tests and say, 
why did you ask this question instead of another question? If there's a test that asks you, who invented, who invented the sewing machine? It wasn't Singer, by the way. It was Elias, <coughs> Elias Howe. How do I remember a, a stupid detail like that? It was my seventh grade project, history project. I don't know. I don't know how I remember that. I don't remember thinking about a lot of stuff that I remember. So if you ask, who invented the, who invented the Reaper? That, some of you remember. Who invented the Reaper? McCormick, the McCormick Reaper. Who invented the steamboat? Fulton. Gee, I still remember some of this. I used to be history. So if you go, let's take some things that were famous inventions. If you say, who invented the steamboat? And you go to them and say, well, why did you ask who invented the steamboat and not who invented the reaper or who invented the sewing machine? What's the answer? If you say, if you have an IQ to say, well, why did you ask this question instead of that question, instead of a similar question? What's the answer? There's only one answer. That's the question that gave me a normal distribution. You got it? This is the series of questions that gave me a normal distribution. Not, oh, because this is my theory of intelligence and this question gets into it. When we get to Piaget, you'll see, he says, I'm asking these questions because I have a theory of how kids' thinking develops, and I'm asking these questions to try to figure out what they're thinking. Not these people. Okay. The tail is wagging the dog. Every question that is asked is asked in order to get a normal distribution. Okay? You'll notice that when you took the SAT, and I believe the ACT too, by the way, ACT definitely uses standardized scores. I just don't know how, how your score figures in, an individual score figures in. Did you ever notice that some are timed? Mm -hmm. Some you get 35 minutes, some you get 25 minutes, some you get 40 minutes. How do they figure out those times? How do they figure out why 35 on this one and 40 on that one? Because that's the way you get the normal distribution. Here, let me show you, okay? I have a test, okay? Come on. Okay, I have a test. And you get 40 minutes to do this subtest on the SAT. Okay? And when I get the scores, the scores distribute like this by and large. If I were to take that same, right? This is the score. And this is the number of, and this, I'm sorry, this is the number of people who got the score. People who got the score. Right? See what I'm saying? If I were to say, you know what, take this, take this test into the other room, spend as much time as you want on it, think it through, if you need to take a break, take a break, you want to drink a cup, you want to get a cup of coffee, go out and get a coffee, there's a cup of coffee, there's a coffee machine in the room, there's a snack bar in the room, just under, and come back whenever you're done. Take an hour, take two hours, whatever you want, I'd get a distribution like this. Right? A whole bunch of people, this is the score, right? A whole bunch of people getting very high scores. Right? Or if I were to say, this is called a skew, this is a, a negative skew, see the skews over here. If I were to say, okay, 15 minutes, do the best you can, i get scores like this. I get scores like this. I'm erasing with my finger like a fool. Okay? <laughs> I get scores like this. Okay? A whole bunch of low scores, and then a very few high scores, right? See what I'm saying? They sit there and they practice. How many minutes should we give to be sure the scores distribute normally? Anybody starting to get a queasy feeling inside? You mean to tell me if you just said, what do you know, go home and take the test and bring it back tomorrow, that the scores will all be higher? That's right. Okay. Now, of course, we're already getting, come back to me for a second, for a while. I'm already getting the, fo the following queasy feelings. 
I thought I put on a blue shirt. Look green, okay. Number one, all of these time tests say if you stop to think it over, if you need time to think things over, you're not as smart as people who don't need times. Jump to go fast. The faster you do things, the smarter you are. That's what they say. Am I right or not? And not only that, let me tell you, there's a book, you, you need to read this book. It's an older book by now, but nothing has changed. It's called None. Sorry. I stopped cursing the pen and apologizing, see? None of the above. And it's by somebody named David Owen. And David Owen is not a psychiatrist. It's a great read. It's just a, a, barrel of, a barrel of laughs. It's great fun. Okay? David Owen is a regular writer. He once wrote a column, Why There Are No Blue M&Ms, right? He was just, you know, before, years ago there weren't any. He just writes stuff. And he went into the, SA, he went into the SAT, okay? When he went into the, into the uh, educational testing service, they're the ones, educational, they're the ones who put out the SAT and many of the standardized tests you take. Testing service. They put out the, you know, the LSAT and the MSAT and the MCAT and all that stuff, okay? He went to them, okay, come back to me, and he said, and he went to look how they work. First of all, by the way, you know how you have to send off to Princeton? They're not in Princeton. They just have a mailbox in Princeton. They have, they're, they're, they have nothing to do with Princeton University. Princeton, you know, there's a town called Princeton, New Jersey, and they are, they're up the road, but they keep their mail because it's all Princeton, it sounds good, right? For instance, at that time, what he wrote was that a, a clerical staff in the office prepared questions, sample questions, and they throw them on the test. Whenever you take one, a, a, an SAT, there are sample questions that don't count. Okay, if the test that you, at that time, if the test that you suggested, this is about 20 years ago, if the question that you suggested fit the normal distribution, you got a $50 bonus. If it didn't, nothing lost. For a long time, there was a section on the SAT, and that section was just phony questions, right? or subsections. Well, the Princeton Review Anybody take the Princeton Review for taking the SAT? They're a group that tells you how to take this test who hate the educational testing service. They taught people how to recognize, they put some people to take how to recognize that phony section or those phony, that phony section of a, that was always a subsection in each section. They taught them how to recognize those phony questions, that phony section, and skip it. Well, and all of a sudden, <laughs> you had too much time and the things began to skew negatively. You got a whole bunch of people getting right answers, so now they pepper them around here and there, so you, you really can't, it takes too much time to look for them. Okay? For years, when I was in high school, we were told, you cannot study for the SAT. You cannot study for it. By the way, all the time they had data in their, in their safe that showed you could. Now everybody studies for it. And it, right? Anybody take the Kaplan review for the SAT? What's the matter with you people? For instance, who, who, did anybody go to an SAT tutoring service of any kind? We got an SAT tutor? Hmm? I bought the Kaplan book. You bought the Kaplan book? How many people bought books to practice, practice books? Yeah, a lot of people. Okay? My son, one of my sons, for instance, he, he would freak out on tests, right? Freak out on standardized tests. Basically, the Kaplan Review reviews the material. That's one approach. There are others who do that, too. The other approach is to learn how to scam the test, okay? So he obviously needed the second one, so I sent him to Princeton, the Princeton Review, right? And they showed him how to scam the test, and you pay a lot of money. It was hundreds of dollars in those days. I don't know. He's been on a college quite a while. It's probably it's more now, I'm sure. And they taught them how to, and you pay once and it's good until you do okay. They teach you how to scam the test. They have what they call a Joe Slug answer. That's the answer that you jump to, but that's not right. Only Joe Slug jumps to that answer. And they give you all kinds of hints for taking the test. Well, he did much better on the test than before, but he, he panicked. 
on a part of the English test, which was better. He did much, much better than the math. He would just freak out on math. Matter of fact, he told me his proudest achievement in college was to find a loophole in the rules and he didn't have to take a math course, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think he took a logic course or something else instead. He found a loophole in the rules. I mean, that's his proudest achievement. <laughs> so, but he freaked out. So he came back, he talked it over with them. They explained to him what he had done wrong. They explained to him where he had deviated from their strategy. Next time he got over 100 points more on that subtest from just practicing on tests. That's something called test sophistication or test wiseness. How good are you at taking tests? Who's from Brooklyn? Did you go to high school in Brooklyn? Long push it down, push it down. Long Island. I told that, oh, that's Long Island, right? Most people say Long Island, but they say Long Island. Remember the Regents exams? Yes. That, I, Tell us what Regents exams are. The Regency exams, I think it was the last year that they had them was when I graduated high school. Is that, oh, they don't have them anymore? I don't think so. I think it was the last state they actually had them to. Yeah. Um, it's like standardized test scores. But it's a statewide statewide fi right, final, and, final exam for each course and you have to study for it the entire year and that's what right. the curriculum in other words is every on. kid who's in biology every adolescent who's in biology is taking the same thing oh did, when i was in high school we studied for those tests and studied for those tests and studied for those tests and studied for those tests well the national merit used to have its own test in kansas i remember you had to be in the 96 percentile to become a national merit finalist in new york state you had to be in the 99th and a half you had to being there, being in the 99th percentile didn't help, right? Why? Because people are smarter in New York? No, because we were so test sophisticated. That's what the Princeton Review teaches you how to do. And by the way, in case you haven't noticed, this is a good way to increase the gap between rich and poor, right? There are a lot of families with decent, who have students who are decent students that can't afford six, seven hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars for tutoring services. And their kids don't do as well as the one who can't, or a private tutor. Or it's even a stretch to buy two or three books from the bookstore. You know, one of those books costs 30 bucks a piece, 40 bucks a piece. How much are they, the, 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 the tutoring books? Yeah, probably. Yeah, that, I mean, so if you've got to buy a, a tutoring book and it's $65 for the, for the SAT, for some people that's a real stretch. And then people say, well, gee, I wonder why the gap between poor kids and rich kids is growing bigger on the SAT. Gee, I wonder why. Okay? So, but more important than that, theory gives way to statistics. That's what I call the S word, statistics. Whenever you ask a question about a standardized test, including the IQ test, including standardized achievement tests, why this? Why that? Why this? The answer is always the S word. Not that S word. Statistics. Because this is what gives me the normal distribution. This is how I can figure out what's going on. Okay? Just one more thing here. Okay, let's, uh, let's go. The Z score, a Z score tells you how many standard deviations below, below the mean you are. So here's the mean. Right, so if you were a little bit above, I don't know, you're 0.5 plus 0.5, minus 0.2, minus 1, minus 2, right? Et okay, now most normal human beings, what is it about this particular score that you hate? I'm a normal human being, I hate it. What's in there that makes you want to throw up? A decimal. Push it down and say it? A decimal. A decimal. No, thank you. And what else? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, say it. It's so close to being perfect. Well, no, you could, ha you could actually do it out if you wanted to, to point two, three, two, but it's a negative sign, too. Most people didn't want to bother with that. So finally, they said, you know what? If you got the mean, we'll give you a 50. It's just arbitrarily. So if you got the mean for your age group or your test, we'll give you a 50. And then for every standard deviation, we'll give you a 10. So if you were standard deviation above the mean, we'll give you a 60. So if you were a tenth of a standard deviation above the mean, we'll give you a 51, right? Let's say, the, let's say the mean was, in your particular group, the mean was, was 90 and the standard deviation was 10. So if you got a 91, we'll give you a plus 0.1. Okay? If you, we'll, instead of giving you a plus 0.1, we'll give you a 51. This is called a T-score. SAT scores are more or less based on this. Okay? 
when the eye, you understand what I'm saying? I'm measuring for your age how many standard deviations above and below the mean you are. Okay, come back to me now. When the SAT people went to do this, they, ha they were switching from the chronological age over mental age. They said, well, what are we gonna do for our score? So let's say we have a seven-year-old, tell me your name, seven-year-old. Alexis. Alexis. What, tell me your last name. I have two, but white dash trailer. Okay, let's hear a kid. So it was white when you were a kid, right? Yeah. What was your last name? This is our nine-year-old. Rychek. Rychek. And this is our 12-year-old. Last name. Kelly. Kelly. So I have told all of their parents your kid's IQ is 100. Now I'm going to come up and say, you know what? Uh, I bring in, I say, you know what, Mrs. White? Uh, I'm just going to pretend your mother's father's last, mother's last name is the same as your last name. I know that. Um, you know your child's IQ was 100? You know what, Mrs. Rychek? You know, Mrs. Kelly, your kid's IQ was 100? Well, we've changed our scoring system now. We're going to the Z score, and your kid's IQ is zero. <laughs> And tell me your last name. Burroughs. What? Burroughs. Burroughs. She, before she had an IQ of 97. And you say, you know, it's almost everything. Come on, Mrs. Burroughs, you know what? Your kid's IQ is minus <laughs> point 0.2. Can you imagine what that did? First of all, it's not an IQ anymore. It's not a quotient. There's no quotient anymore. We're just measuring deviations. But they didn't want to upset the good thing they had going. So they made the obvious choice. They said, you know what? Since the average IQ before was 100, right, I can still tell Mrs. White, Mrs. Rychek, and Mrs. Kelly. Why do I remember last names better than first names? Maybe because they're less common, right? Your kid's IQ is still 100. Now the question is, what do I do above and below the mean? What am I going to tell Burroughs, right? Mrs. Burroughs. So what they try to do is piddle around both the Stanford Binet, which was the big test there, and the new one, the Wexler, which we use. They said, let's try to mess around with it so that the new scores come out about the same as the old scores. So I don't suddenly have to tell people, well, you know, your kid's IQ used to be 97, now it's 42. So this means the same. No, I don't think so. Means the same thing. Yeah, sure. Your kid's IQ was 100, now it's zero. Means the same thing. No, 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 they didn't want to do that. So what they did is they said, look, whatever the standard deviation is for your age group, the age group of your kid, my two five-year-olds, how old are you? No, seven-year-olds. My two seven-year-olds, nine-year-old, twelve-year-old. Whatever. They, if they got the average, we're going to give them a hundred still. A hundred means the average. Okay, it's just arbitrary. You, you get that? It's arbitrary. If you got the average, I'm giving you a hundred, not a zero. <coughs> how many people's eyes are starting to fog over? I'll close my eyes and say, oh my God, this mathematical baloney is driving me crazy. I'm closing my eyes. Raise your hands. Okay, put them down. Were their hands up? Yes. That's the point. <laughs> this is the simple stuff. When somebody comes into an ARD meeting, you know what ARD meetings are? Those are the meetings where it's decided whether you're going to be in special ed or not. We'll get to that in a second. And they say, well, your child had a, a, a test that was a, a 0.27 standard deviations below the mean and had an auditory processing problem, and uh, we have to do a retest, and, uh, da, ba, ba, and, and we, you know, we did a reliability and validity study. And you go, whatever you say, whatever you say. <laughs> it's called blinding with science. Okay? It's called blinding with science. The Greeks, remember I told you about this? 
This is one of the logical fallacies. A logical fallacy is something that doesn't make sense, or it's a way to get people to, con to, to accept your argument even though your logic stinks. The Greeks identified almost every logical fallacy that we have today, ways to, like, if A equals B, then B equals A. If you're a communist, you wear a red shirt, so if you wear a red shirt, you must be a communist. People do that all the time, right? Somebody just did it to me the other day. Uh, uh, I'll tell you in a second. This is a new one. Throw out a bunch of scientific jargon, and everybody says, wow, you must be right. Okay, come back to the, uh, come back to me. I'll tell you what happened to me. I, uh, over the last few years, I'm not sure what way I should give away my politics here. I don't have much use for the UN. Don't like it. We're going to take a whole bunch of dictatorial regimes and a few democracies and get together and make a wonderful world? I don't think so. But in the last few years, I became very hostile to the UN. So I have a UN logo on my door with a big circle and a red slash through it, right? So somebody slips a note under my door, just signed it with a first name, giving me the websites where all the Nazis and Ku Klux Klan and ultra-right ring groups are opposed to the UN. So right-wing bigots are opposed to the UN. So if you're opposed to the UN, you must make be a right-wing bigot. You must be a right-wing bigot. Okay. That the ancient Greeks knew, but blinding with science, they didn't. Anybody shocked to find a professor at a university who's opposed to the UN? You're going to find out that I'm not very politically correct. Okay. In any case, so let me just finish this argument so you can understand it. So what they did was that Wexler, the, the Sanford Bernays said 16 points. The Wexler said 15 points, probably because they're business competitors, but that's how it works. So in other words, if, let me take three different people. You can give me your first name, so go ahead. Rosanna. Rosanna. Rosanna's eight, okay? Come back to me now. And the average number right, the average number right for eight-year-olds was 27, the standard deviation Let's make it 30. And the standard deviation was 5. And Rosanna got a 35. I'm making easy numbers. It would be bigger than that, right? She's one standard deviation above the mean. I said, okay, 115. Tell me your name. Adam. Adam is 12. Okay? Come back to me. The average number right for 12-year-olds was 103, and the standard deviation was 6. He got 109, one standard deviation above the mean. 115. Okay, tell me your name. Katie. Katie. Were you named after the city or was the city named after you? <laughs> after her, she said. Okay. Katie is, is, is for 15. The average number right for 15 year olds was 130 with a standard deviation of 15. She got 145 points. That's the number of points, right? So once they deviation above the mean, her IQ is 115. Okay? That's all I'm saying. And why? How come there's such a small standard deviation for littler kids and such a big one for the 8-year-olds and such a big one for the 15-year-olds? The answer is, leave me alone. I don't care. I've got this magic instrument to measure. And I can go across age groups. And so what we see here, and so here's the jargon that you'll hear. 68, a little over 68% of the kids are between minus and minus one and plus standard one deviations of the mean. About 96% of the kids are between minus two and plus two. If you add these up, you'll see it comes out to around 96, etc. That's what you're getting. You're getting a measure that's driven, that's driven by this normal distribution. Intelligence is a normal distribution. Achievement has to be a test with a normal distribution. So this is the basis for calculating IQ scores. It's the basis for calculating percentiles. It's the base, okay, a percentile score indicates how many people scored lower than that person on the test. We'll do it in a second. And, it's, and, and, and the normal distribution is the basis for scores to labels such as retarded and learning disabled. Oops, sorry. Um, let's go back here. Okay. See if we get my picture in the corner there. 
okay? A percentile tells you how many people scored above or below you on the test. See, can you get my picture in the corner? Is that humanly possible? Okay. So, here's what we have. I guess I'm having a glitch back there. You'll notice, by the way, for the use of study, in a normal distribution, the mean, the median, the mode are all the same number, right? The mean is the average, the median is the score in the middle, and the mode is the most common score. They're all the same number, right? Mm -hmm. That's another reason why statisticians love this. What percentile are you in if you're exactly in the average? Remember, the percentile score is... How many people scored lower than you did on the test, and that person did on the test? Okay, so what percentile you're in if you're here? 50th percentile, right? You see, exactly half of the people scored lower than you did. Let's say you're a standard deviation above the mean. What percentile are you in without the decimal? 84th. Who doesn't see that? You see we're in the 84th? Here you were in the 50th. Now, if you have this score, you jumped over 34% more of the people. So you're in the 84th percentile. There should be a 50 right up there, right? Right there, there should be a 50. That's the 50th percentile. What percentile are you in if you're one standard deviation below the mean? No, it's not 30. No, you're below. Now... These 50, you did worse than these 50%, plus worse than these 34%. You're way down here. Only these people, you can actually add this up and see. 16th percentile, right? You fell below another 34. If you add these up, you'll see you get a roughly 16% of the people are below you, right? There's another, this roughly, right? You see what I'm saying? So if somebody tells you you're in the 48th percentile, you're right about there, right? Probably, I don't know. A tenth of a standard deviation below the mean, something like that. If you're in the 70th percentile, you probably got a score right there, half a standard deviation above the mean, right? See what I'm saying? Because here's 86, here's 50. We could, you could figure it out. If you gave me your statistics, but I could figure it out. Or I could bring in my statistician. He would tell me faster. Okay? So that's how percentiles work. It's something, that's how stainine would work. I don't want to go into that, but... No, again, it's a, it's a measure of nine instead of percentiles. That's how they all work. And, and because IQ tests use this, and the learning disabled label in particular is tied to IQ and achievement tests, all achievement tests use the same kind of logic. Okay, thus, ooh, let's do that again. That's a cute. Thus, I don't even know how to do that. Ooh, look at this one. Look at those things go. Okay, thus, the major consideration for determining what questions will appear on an IQ or any other standardized test, the SAT, the achievement tests, all the standardized achievement tests, the kid get the owl and the towel and the Woodcock Johnson and all the other ones that are used in the schools, is, is whether or not a question will contribute to achieving a normal distribution. Why did you ask that question? The answer is the S word, statistics. This gives me the normal distribution. You have a theory behind it? Next question, please. Okay. Retardation. Okay. So on IQ test, <laughs> retardation is not a measure of reasoning ability or problem solving. It may come in there, but that's not what they're interested in. Retardation is a statistical construct. It means having an IQ score that is more standard two than two standard deviations below the mean. You get it? Here, I'll show you. Sorry. Anyone from here down is retarded. From where down? From here. Two standard deviations below the mean. The bottom two, two and a half percent, roughly. Right? Right? We have a standard deviation of 50. So if you're one standard deviation below the mean for your age group, your IQ is going to be 85. Right? We're going to take off 15 points. If you're two standard deviations below, we're going to give take for your age group. We're going to take up another 15 points, that's 70. Okay? Below 70, you're retarded. Mm -hmm.
before they gave the first test, it was decided that about roughly 2.5% are retarded. This doesn't come out to quite 25 It's 2.14, but you've got a, a little bit in here, right, that they don't have a half percent. So it's roughly 2.5%, a little bit that are below 3. That was decided before anybody ever took the test. Because it's a statistical construct. Okay? Let me just show this to you. Let me just show it to you. Whoops. Okay. There we go. Okay, look. Here's how it works. Between 90 and 110. In other words, about just a little, maybe a, a third of a standard deviation above, below the mean to a third of a standard deviation above the mean. That's normal IQ. Okay? Let's go the highway to 110. From 110 to, 100, to 110 to 115 is better than average. 115 to 130 is what we use, sometimes they call it bright. Okay, accelerated learner. From 130 up, that's gifted. And if you get above 145, that's genius. That's gifted from 130 up, right? By the way, if you use the, the Stanford Binet, it'd be 116, 132, 148, right? Between, let's say here is 90, between 85 and 90, right? This would be 85 here, right? 15 points below. That's slow learner. That's, that's low normal. Between 70 and 85 is slow learner, right? See, in this section, between minus two and minus one, that's what we call slow learner or da, 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 right? And then below this, below 70, is retarded. And you can divvy this up with statistics to used to have trainable, educable mental retarded and trainable mental retarded, profoundly retarded, all these kinds of labels that were stuck on people. Because you can actually go down to four and five and six, well, one tenth of one percent or five standard deviations below the mean. That's not the accurate number, but you get the point, right? So here's the question. What we have to ask ourselves then is reliability and validity. These scores are tremendously accurate. Okay, we can, I'm going to do something here. Okay. Tell me your first name. Jennifer. Wait, wait a second. Go ahead. Jennifer, okay. Come stand over here. Okay? Everybody take a look at Jennifer. Write down how tall she is. Write it down. Have a guesstimate. You know how tall you are, right? Don't say. Okay. Okay. Did so you write it down? Cut it down? How many people had below five feet? Who had five? Let's see if we can get the camera on them. Who had five one? We had two people with five one. Who had three people? Who had five two? About three. Who had five three? Well, we had about six or seven. Who had five four? Another one, six, seven. Who had five five? Well, we're going to see how it's distributing normally. Now a few less. You see, three, three and five, four is right in the middle. Who had five, six? Another three. Anybody have higher than five, uh, taller than five, six? Jennifer, how tall are you? Five, three. Five, three. Who got it right? So we got one, two, three, four, five. About eight people got it right. That's, eh. Nobody said that she's, that she's five foot. Nobody said that she's even five, eight. That's not too bad. That's a rough guesstimate. Okay? Not very reliable. More reliable than saying, I know somebody named Jennifer. Guess how tall she is? <laughs> okay? At least we could take a look. Now, if I took Jennifer and I gave you a yardstick, I gave everybody a yardstick and said, Jennifer, stand straight here and we're going to measure how tall Jennifer is, I guarantee you that the closest we would get, if, if she's exactly 5'3", is between, we would get measures from 5'2 to 5'3 My If somebody said, are you ready to bet 10 bucks that we get between 5'2 and 5'4, I'd take the bet. Particularly with a yardstick, because remember, she's told her you have a yardstick and it comes up to here and then I gotta put my finger here and then go like this, right? 
I'd probably be a little more accurate with a tape measure because I could drop it from her head and go on a, right? But I would still get a tape measure would be a yardstick's more reliable than the guesstimate you just did. A tape measure would probably be more reliable than the yardstick. And then, okay, I could take triangulating laser beams from three different places and get that she is 5.5 feet, 2.9783642 inches. And I would do that three times, that's what I get. That's the most reliable measure. So I have a very, very good reliable measure. And now, I'm going to say, I now have a good estimate of how good a basketball player she is. Eh? Because height is my measure of how good a basketball player you are. I'm talking to you in case nobody noticed. I guarantee you, sight on scene, she's a better basketball player than I am. The coach once said to me, Lieberman, your passing is average, your dribbling's a little bit below average, and your shooting's a little bit below average. But when you put them together, you are the worst basketball player I have ever seen. My position was kick out. I used to pick a fight with the best player on the other team, and then the two of us would get kicked out. Okay? Didn't make a difference to my team, okay? So I have a very reliable measure. The question is, is it valid? And we'll talk about that next session about validity and reliability of tests.